and welcome to Clean Water, Green Space, and Social Equity, our program here at the Massachusetts Historical Society for Earth Day. My name is Catherine Algor, and I'm the president here at the Society, and I welcome you to this public program. And I hope, uh, I hope you have a good time. I'm sure you're going to learn a lot. And I hope you'll be interested in kind of getting to know us. So um, the way to do it these days is really to visit our website, which is masshist dot org, masshist.org, public programs, future and present and past public programs in our calendar and in our videos. Uh, we have a, a blog there, we have an object of the month, and we have lots and lots of material for you to enjoy. And while you're there, you can find our social media platforms. We are on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. And if you're one of those social media types, uh, do find us that way. And if you're live tweeting this program, and I hope you are, please use the hashtag MHS1791. MHS1791, the year we were founded. But let's get going. We have a wonderful panel tonight. And to introduce it, I'm going to um, introduce my uh, colleague, Gavin. Gavin, take it away. Thank you, Catherine. And thank you all for joining us. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Gavin Cleesby, and I am the Director of Programs, Exhibitions, and Community Partnerships for the Massachusetts Historical Society. And I'm happy to welcome all of you uh, to our virtual program on Earth Day. Uh, if you've not attended our programs in the past, let me mention that MHS is the oldest historical society in America. Uh, as Catherine mentioned, we were founded in 1791 and have been an independent nonprofit institution dedicated to collecting, preserving, publishing, and sharing our state and our nation's history for the past 230 years. Uh, we host uh, a wide variety of programs, uh, including uh, seminars that are geared towards a more, more academic audience uh, and programs that are meant for anyone with a love of, of American history. Uh, generally speaking, we host uh, between two and three original events a week, um, and they're all open to the public. Uh, if you enjoy the talk this evening, I hope you'll check out our calendar and find out what else we have coming up. Uh, we're very excited about our program tonight, um, at least in part because we love partnering with other organizations. Our discussion tonight was put together with the Muddy Water Initiative, which is a grassroots environmental group that pilots low-cost community accessible solutions to pollution in urban waterways. They work in uh, public-private partnerships on the Muddy River, which is right outside MHS, uh, with local students, volunteers, and community-generated ideas to take trash off the river's surface uh, and filter pollution out of the water itself. Uh, the Water Goat uh, is entering its second year. It's their best known project, and it is a trash skimmer that has taken hundreds of pounds of trash out of the muddy. Uh, we're happy to partner with our neighbors to bring you this program. Our program tonight uh, will explore the past, present, and future of urban wild spaces in Boston, beginning with Olmsted's vision of the Emerald Necklace and continuing onto parks created in the 21st century. We'll look at these urban parklands and their rivers and ponds through the lens of social equity and environmental justice. Joining us to guide our discussion uh, is Sarah Glazer. She is a journalist based in New York City uh, who is a contributing writer at CQ or Congressional Quarterly Researcher, uh, where she writes about topics ranging from immigration to treating mental illness. Her articles on publishing and translation have appeared in the New York Times Book Review, and her articles on health and education have been published in the Washington Post and Glamour. She teaches feature writing for print and digital media at the NYU School of Professional Studies uh, in the Center for App Applied Liberal Arts. So uh, without further ado, please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Sarah to, to be our moderator. Thank you very much, Gavin, for that nice introduction. Um, I'd like to say that I think my main qualification for being here tonight is that I grew up exploring another great park uh, designed by the great park designer, Frederick Law Olmsted, Central Park. And I have to say that in almost every city I've lived in, whether it's Boston, Chicago, or New York, the most beautiful and best loved places seem to have been designed by Olmsted. Um, so let me just tell you what our format will be tonight. I'll be introducing each of our three panelists. Um, each of them will give a brief statement. Then we're going to have a com conversation about the topic of this evening. And then we'll open the uh, floor to um, selected questions from the audience. Um, 
So I would like to start by introducing our first panelist, Karen Monty Brodick. Um, Karen Monty Brodick is president of the Emerald Necklace Conservancy, a private nonprofit stewardship organization, which was founded to maintain and protect the parks of the Emerald Necklace. And that is the linear park system in Boston designed by Frederick Law Olmsted. At the Conservancy, uh, Ms. Monty Brodick is working to restore and improve Boston's Emerald Necklace Park for All. She led the successful celebration of the Conservancy's 20th anniversary in 2018, which featured an exhi exhibition of fog sculptures by the Japanese artist Fujiko Nakaiwa throughout the necklace. She is currently undertaking a major revitalization of Charles Gate Park with the neighborhood group Charles Gate Alliance. Prior to the Conservancy, Ms. Moni Brodick worked as Deputy Director for Park Planning in the San Francisco Parks Department. And prior to that, she was with the New York Department of Parks and Recreation, where she was Chief of the Design Build Program. Please take the floor, Ms. Moni Brodick. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, great. So I'm going to uh, provide a little bit of overview background. I was asked to do a little bit of sort of a big picture history of uh, Boston's park system, which is uh, primarily the, the Emerald Necklace. Um, and so I'm starting with that. Again, uh, really pleased to be here. Thank you so much, Mass Historic and uh, the Muddy Water Initiative and others that, that arranged this. So uh, it, this was, Amer is America's oldest linear park system. It was designed by Frederick Law Olmsted, who also did a project called Central Park, you may have heard of. Um, but here in Boston, you know, I think we should take a lot of pride that this, this park system was really quite notable in some distinct ways. The, uh, the, it runs from uh, the Charles River uh, to Franklin Park. Um, first and foremost, I would like to start off just acknowledging uh, something that uh, I think we, we all are reflecting on more today uh, than perhaps we did in the past, which is that uh, we are uh, today working on thinking about uh, engaging with and occupying uh, land uh, that was the regional and unceded territory of the Massachusetts people. And so here there is some information about uh, the peoples that, um, that occupied and uh, took care and care took this land for, for, for millennia uh, here, just to remind everyone that um, this land uh, has a history that we are not going to be discussing today in, in great detail, um, but it did not start, of course, uh, with Columbus's arrival. So I always, I'm starting to uh, try and make this part of, uh, of our practice and especially uh, the lands of the Emerald Necklace have been changed profoundly. Uh, so it's all the more reason to sort of reflect on how, um, how the land uh, was taken care of and, um, and stewarded before, before, um, before European uh, uh, conquest. So uh, here, um, I'm just going to kind of start at the uh, the beginning of a story that I think is a little less uh, perhaps well known. Uh, this map um, identifies the fact that a lot of people might think that the Emerald Necklace or parks were built to be parks, but actually um, the Emerald Necklace park system was, uh, was built to solve essentially a sewage problem. Uh, it is... Um, I, we joke that it's a sewer or a water park uh, disguised as a park. Um, this is a map that was uh, developed in 1878 that shows some of the areas of perceived uh, offensive odors perceived in Boston. And uh, so these were areas that you would definitely want to avoid in, in low tide. Uh, what you're seeing here, I don't know if you guys can see my, my pointer, uh, but what you're seeing is sort of the downtown Boston area and this uh, large uh, sort of octopus-like um, uh, pink area is the Back Bay Fens, uh, essentially the, the area that was tidal uh, and that Olmsted really profoundly reshaped in order to manage uh, the sewage and um, other sort of modern, um, uh, modern, you know, 
out, out, outfalls from all of the new development that had been built within Boston. So much of Boston was, was, is landfill. Uh, modern sewers were really, you know, only starting to be developed uh, at the turn of the century. And so Boston was challenged in the way a lot of other cities were. And uh, it was clear that something needed to change. Uh, certainly you could, um, you know, address this in a big pipe, but perhaps you could also use the forces of uh, the title, you know, the, the Charles River would have still been, was still title at that time. And uh, could, the tide could come in and could come out and could sort of manage uh, sewage. And, uh, and Olmsted decided to use that really profoundly. And I think it's, it's a really uh, interesting thing to think about the fact that the uh, emerald necklace, which was shaped uh, to manage essentially a health issue, um, is, is today actually becoming even more relevant for, uh, for Bostonians today too in the middle of uh, another major health crisis. So here you're seeing uh, the, the modern, um, or essentially the emerald necklace after uh, Olmsted uh, started to, to, to design it. Uh, the portion here is the Charles Gate portion, which actually there was a, a picture that Gavin showed on the first slide. Uh, and you can see uh, Commonwealth Avenue, uh, Mass Histor Historic Society, if I'm not uh, mistaken, is located right here. Um, and uh, this is the Mass Pike. And so he essentially took what was a watery uh, estuary and uh, shaped it uh, deliberately into something that looks uh, organic. Uh, and this became, you know, managing this water system uh, became a way to uh, to handle uh, both um, stormwater and and he created a separate system to manage sanitary uh, sewage, which ran alongside this, and also a way to sort of create a recreational uh, and uh, an open space, natural space uh, for the public. Um, I think. Uh, you can see here the over overarching sort of vision ending uh, in Franklin Park. This is a set of parks that, that we steward today, uh, uh, the Emerald Necklace Conservancy. Uh, here you can really see very clearly, you know, that this is an entirely constructed system. Um, it's, uh, you know, it, it is disguised in a lot of uh, great uh, plant material and other things, but it needs our continued, uh, our continued stewardship and investment. Uh, and you know there are times, and there have been in our in in history when uh, cities have spent less uh, and more, but at, at recent times and recent decades, uh, less to 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 take care of and steward these these things, and uh, and we have seen uh, the product of some of that um, negligence. Um, I'm not going to spend a ton of time talking about the emerald necklace. Uh, and, and, and everything about what we do, but um, I'm sure we'll, I'll be able to put something in the chat if you wanna learn a little bit more about our activities. But I wanna talk a little bit more about what happens if you don't take care of, um, of a park system. So uh, in 1996, um, the, the river that Olmsted had so uh, carefully laid out uh, had, um, there was essentially a period of intense storm and the, the and there was a, a huge flood. Uh, it caused, um, as you can see, many, many feet of, um, of water uh, to damaging the, uh, one of the green line, green line, uh, essentially the, the subway here in Boston. And it shut down the, the T, the section of the T for many months. Um, there are stories about um, you know, the, the basement of the Museum of Fine Arts being flooded and uh, people in the area in rowboats. Um, so uh, what, had, what had happened, and I can show you a couple of the reasons for that. One is just that you have to take care of, sorry, it's going in the wrong direction here. I want to show you this picture. So what had happened is that in, um, in a, a particularly um, a, a time that uh, people didn't uh, perhaps respect uh, the need for uh, maintaining the river. Uh, Sears, this building was the Sears Roebuck building. Um, essentially, Sears asked for more parking. They said if they didn't get more parking, they would leave Boston. And so what was a river um, became uh, a parking lot. And this area was paved. 
uh, and uh, rivers don't like to be in pipes. And uh, it's at this point uh, here, uh, the, the T was really, was flooded. So this was a major sort of essentially clog in, uh, in the capacity, um, but also uh, in other areas, and you can see it a little bit here and you can see it a little bit here, we had a serious situation where uh, invasive species because of the lack of maintenance and lack of investment in uh, inner city parks um, that are really, you know, urban infrastructure uh, had essentially um, choked out the ability for the, the muddy river to function as it had uh, been designed. Um, the good news is that the Army Corps of Engineers, um, after tremendous amount of pressure and influence and work and, and uh, essentially advocacy work by many groups, um, including uh, the Emerald Nest Conservancy that was really born in this, flight, in this fight, um, provided a tremendous uh, influence so that the um, Army Corps of Engineers uh, started two projects. Uh, one, the Muddy River uh, restoration that essentially removed uh, the parking lot and daylit that back into um, the Muddy River. Uh, and you can see it today. Um, many of you may have already may have seen this area. Um, that's, you know, again, just outside uh, what was called the Landmark Center is now 401 Park Street, um, where essentially they, they put back um, the river. And then now um, there's additional work um, happening with, um, here you can see the completed uh, phase one phase one project. Um, I, I just wanna mention that we are, we are not done. Um, the Muddy River still has a tremendous uh, need for continued investment and improvement. Um, we have uh, seen recently with uh, testing uh, that has occurred that the Muddy River um, gets the lowest score of any of the tributaries to the Charles River with a D minus uh, rating. Uh, and that rating uh, really comes only from testing E. coli levels. Uh, it doesn't test all of the things that perhaps you would, um, you would want to, to point out. Um, and this here, what I'm really talking about is sort of the uh, the environment, uh, the physical environment. Um, but I do want to I do want to point out. Uh, and I want to go back a little bit to a slide that I wanted to focus on. Um, but you know, the the Emerald Necklace is directly adjacent to many high needs neighborhoods um, uh, that serve Black, Indigenous, people of color, children, and elderly populations, and those are the populations that we know um, are most in need of close by parkland. Uh, you know, a lot of times, um, you know, uh, populations that don't have tremendous means or access to green space outside the city, you know, neighborhood open space is important for both health reasons, but also access reasons um, and, uh, you know, transportation uh, and, and a variety of other, of other important uh, factors. And what we what we we started to do uh, in detail in the last uh, couple of years um, through the uh, work the, the work the conservancy is doing we've been starting to really analyze which sections of the emerald necklace can focus on serve which areas that have um, the most uh, populations and the greatest need of these sort of park investments um, and there's a few things that we are doing to try and acknowledge that and i think one of the things that um that we should all think about as we work on projects that restore physical sections of the Emerald Necklace or of any park system is how can these investments also serve community members directly, address things that community members would like to see. Um, a lot of times our conversations are really driven by science and those are important, but the reason why we wanna make these physical uh, environmental improvements is because we want the parks to be healthier for the communities that they are meant to serve. So really trying to keep those uh, those things in alignment, I think, is sometimes something that uh, that can can escape us. And I'm really thinking a lot about how we can do that um, more forcefully uh, in our work to come. Currently, we are working on two or three projects that I think are very focused around equity. There is an opportunity to restore a portion of Franklin Park. Um, that we've been uh, been working on. Um, it's a site that was occupied by a hospital building, which is now slated for demolition. So there's an opportunity to restore green space there. Uh, and it's of course complicated as things always are, uh, continuing to work on the D minus uh, rating. Um, 
and trying to see how we can improve the water quality. Um, but all of these things taken in their totality and with the work that I'm very excited that Chris is gonna to talk to you about next, uh, ways that we can better link um, all of our, our parks and not think of each neighborhood park and each community as a separate uh, area, but perhaps there's something that can be bigger than the whole uh, if we connect all these things. And so we can sort of bring everyone up. Um, I think I'm gonna end there just in the interest of time I have a feeling I went on a little bit longer than expected. So if you would like to know more about the Emerald Necklace, I'm sure we can uh, find a way to, to provide you more information uh, you know, after, this, after the presentation, perhaps in the chat. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you very much for that great presentation. Um, I'm actually going to call next uh, on Representative Nika Elugardo um, and uh, let me just tell you a little bit uh, about her. Um, she is the Massachusetts State Representative for District 15, which includes a large swath of the Emerald Necklace Park system, along with the neighborhoods of Brookline, Jamaica Plain, Mich Mission Hill, and Roslindale. Uh, Representative Elugardo has over 20 years of experience in community and economic development with public, private, and nonprofit leaders in communities of color. She was founding director of Mass Saves, which connected low and moderate income residents to banks, and she founded the research and consulting departments at the Emanuel Gospel Center to work on youth and violence protection prevention and anti-trafficking. Um, the rep representative Elugardo earned her Bachelor of Science in Urban Planning from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and a Master of Public Policy from the Kennedy School of Government. Uh, and she also has a law degree from the Boston University School of Law. Uh, welcome representative Elugardo. Thank you for having me and uh, I'm just excited about the trend of connecting so many policy areas like climate, like even incarceration, education and social justice to green space. So I'm very excited about being able to talk from a personal level. I was asked to speak just a little bit about my personal background more than my political one. Uh, but of course can take policy questions in the Q&A. So we think about justice and do we think about green space? I mean, okay, a couple hundred people on this call, yes. But when you see media and, and news and uh, politicians speak about justice, do we talk about green space? When we think about the impacts of poverty and mental health, are we thinking about green space? When we think about uh, the disproportionate impacts of climate, change or even the pandemic on BIPOC people of color, black indigenous people and elders, do we think about green space? You know, my personal story is one of millions of stories, I, I think around the world. I've worked in other countries. I think these, is some, these are some universal concepts. Uh, it demonstrates that there's an intrinsic link between access to green space for peace, for play, for refuge, for recreation, and even just for looking at it, just for viewing. There's a, there's a deep connection between that and dismantling structural inequities. You know, so, you know, I grew up in Columbus, Ohio, um, moved a lot, 14 times, I think, before I moved out when I was 17. And, uh, you know, I had, by the end, I had six younger siblings. Uh, and when I was a kid, there were five of us all living together. A couple more were born later. Crowded conditions often. We lived um, below the poverty line for my entire childhood. And the more kids there were, uh, the more feisty things got. And the more crowded things were, the more stressful things got. And so as the oldest, I would often take my sisters, my little sisters out to parks just to help them calm down. They would fight less they would uh, breathe more, they would laugh more, they would smile more. And the reason I did that is because I came from a long heritage. My grandfather grew up in Pikeville, Kentucky and was used to being outside and running around barefoot in Appalachia. And I kind of inherited that from him. He would take us out often 
And so my family had a really special relationship with nature that was not um, shared by so many of uh, my peers who were growing up in very, very low income urban areas. And I remember uh, my mother making it a priority to get me to summer camp. And I remember uh, choosing, instead of doing a corporate internship in high school, when we had that requirement, petitioning to live with the Amish and work on a farm. And these experiences collectively became not only um, deeply spiritual, transformative experiences in my life, but they provided a refuge from the other things going on in my life, which included you know, drug dealing, addiction, substance use disorder, you know, in my, in my home and around me in my community, uh, tra uh, trafficking of var various kinds, and a lot of the um, negative impacts of poverty uh, and, 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 and crime that, that come with being a kid when you're growing up in that way, they were really not only diffused, um, uh, but completely counterbalanced by experiences I was able to have with nature. And so when I came to MIT, I joined up with the Outing Club and continued that work. And when I got older uh, and had my own daughter and, and my siblings were much younger than me and I'd bring them to stay with me, uh, we kept up these trends. One of my sisters uh, had, has, has a mental illness that's quite severe. And while she wasn't being treated, the father of her children were killed and, and that compounded trauma uh, caused the family to go in a spiral. So we brought my sister and her kids, four of her four children to live with us here in Boston. And uh, my nephews and nieces had never been to the ocean. Um, they hadn't been taken hiking. And I remember when my husband and I first said, you know what? It's gonna be a requirement of you living with us every weekend. We're gonna do either something educational or something in nature. And they basically wanted to vomit at the sound of both of those types of things. And we said, it's a requirement, you're gonna do it. And particularly, I remember my nephew, Linnell, who was at the time, I think about nine years old, he was absolutely adamant that he would not join us on these things. And he had been expelled from school, you know, at the age of seven and at the age of eight, not just suspended, but expelled. And this is a kid who was experiencing major traumas, who had seen his father, who had been, you know, shot in the head, which is a hard thing to say. Uh, but he had to, he had to look at that. And the response that the school system had was to kick him out, in, you know, in Ohio. And so he'd been through a lot and he thought that he was going to hate nature. And I remember the very first uh, hike we took was just, we went over to Blue Hills and uh, we let the kids out and we let them run. And we, we hiked up to the top of the hill in the observatory and, and did all the fun stuff. And Linnell did not want to leave. And Linnell was always the first person after that in the car and the last person in the car to go home with all the things we did each weekend. And it was a very healing experience for him and for my, uh, the other members of my family. While Linnell was with us for that year and a half, he started making A's and B's exclusively in school. He was straight A's in science, couldn't get enough of the Museum of Science, especially the parts about natural history and animal behavior. And a whole element of his personality came alive. One of my aunts and her partner visited us for Christmas while the kids were still with us. And Linnell couldn't stop talking to her about the development of spiders and what he'd learned about sharks and how he'd seen the bees at the Museum of Science. And he had a memory, he could remember every detail he'd ever heard or read about these things. So we started calling him the professor. And I remembered my aunt saying to, I remember my aunt saying to me, Nika, I've never heard Linnell say more than four words at a time. And so just his, his true self, his true personality came alive because of his access to nature. And, you know, I think that our connection to green space is sacred. I think our responsibility to protect that connection is sacred and to protect it equally for all people uh, is in my view, uh, one of the most special and important responsibilities that I have as an elected official and that all elected officials have. So while we can get into the policy and must, and we have to look at what dismantling structural inequity actually looks like when you're creating access uh, that wasn't there or hasn't been there for certain populations. 
We also need to remember these are deeply personal stories, not only sad stories, but also inspiring uh, and wonderful stories that can be part of the transformational narrative uh, that we're bringing forward in this season. Thank you, Representative El Ugarda. That's a truly inspiring and moving uh, tale that you told. And um, I think it speaks to a lot of us um, who, who love green spaces um, and nature and parks. Um, I'm going to go next to Professor Chris Reed. Um, Chris Reed is founding director of Stoss Landscape Urbanism. He has two hats at the Harvard University Graduate School of Design as both professor in the practice of landscape architecture and co-director of the program Master of Landscape Architecture in Urban Design. Professor Reed is recognized internationally as a leading voice in the transformation of landscapes and cities. In Boston, his firm is part of a team that is currently transforming Moakley Park into a climate resilient park in one of Boston's largest open waterfront spaces. He has worked on urban revitalization, climate resist, resilient efforts, adaptations of former industrial sites, and public spaces that cultivate a diversity of social uses. His work can be found in cities as diverse as Boston, Los Angeles, St. Louis, Dallas, Detroit, Galveston, Abu Dhabi, and Dongshan, China. Welcome, Professor Reed. Great. Uh, thank you, Sarah. It's a pleasure to be here with you, uh, with Representative uh, El Ugardo and with Karen. Uh, happy Earth Day to everybody. Um, I want to tell you a little bit uh, about Moakley Park uh, and uh, a new era of how we begin to think about green space uh, in the city of Boston. Um, these days, uh, the issue of clean water has as much to do with climate change as anything else. Uh, and I think the park as we've um, embarked on it with the city of Boston, um, with the uh, Parks and Recreation Department uh, is intentionally becoming a model uh, for how you address issues of social equity and social justice uh, in open space uh, design. For those of you who don't know it, uh, Moakley Park um, is a 60 acre park um, in South Boston, right on the edge of Dorchester. Uh, but as you can begin to see from this photograph, not so far from Chinatown, uh, not so far from the South End, not so far really from uh, a number of uh, neighborhoods of Roxbury uh, and Dorchester beyond. It's Boston's largest waterfront park, um, and yet a lot of people don't realize, uh, A, it's there, uh, and B, uh, it is this large piece of green space uh, on the park. You have this amazing view to Carson Beach and the harbor and harbor islands uh, beyond. You can see it's largely programmed to be a sports park uh, with a lot of flat fields um, uh, and opportunities for baseball, rugby, soccer, football uh, and the like. Um, the park uh, is located uh, here, you can see on the screen. Importantly, it's at the intersection of a number of uh, regional linkages. Karen talked about the uh, emerald necklace, which you can see here. Uh, the last link of that necklace was never built along Columbia Road. Uh, Moakley sits right at the end of that. Uh, Moakley is also along the Harbor Walk, which allows for diverse experiences along Boston's entire waterfront. Uh, and then it sits at an intersection of what's called um, uh, the, uh, a, a series of green pathways uh, that connect uh, into various city neighborhoods uh, and are really meant for improving access um, for bicycles and pedestrians throughout the city. And so it, it really occupies this, this important moment. For uh, the history buffs in the audience, I know, I know you're there. 
Um, it's interesting because the park uh, is built on what was originally marshland and mudflats. This wasn't uh, land. This was made land. Um, in 1909, um, it became a city dump uh, and then, oddly enough, a playground. Um, and eventually was filled with dredged harbor clay uh, in 1919. Uh, and this is when it became uh, a sports park. Um, the park operates at a number of scales because of the size of it. Uh, here you can see the park uh, within the context. Importantly, um, it's bordered by um, two Boston public housing developments, uh, the Mary Ellen McCormick housing and old colony housing. These are neighborhoods uh, and communities with significant multiracial, multi-ethnic BIPOC uh, populations that live just across the street. Uh, of course, this is within the context of South Boston, Harbor Point, um, uh, and a few uh, future redevelopment sites. Even though those populations are really close, though, there are a whole series of disconnections um, to the park. There are very, very large roadways that separate people from the park and actually make it dangerous to cross into the park. Once you're in the park, there's another roadway that then separates people from Carson Beach. So even though these neighborhoods are very, very close to the water, access to the harbor, access to open space um, is, is hard to get here. And that's one of the things we want to address. Also, the park isn't well tailored to the people who are right there. Yes, there are a lot of great sports fields and there are communities that come here to use those. But other than that, there's not a whole lot for people to do. Um, if you can get across the street, there's not enough for elders, there's not enough for kids. And so how can we rethink the programming of the park to really make this a better community park for those people who live right across the street, right? How is it we get them into the park uh, and then to the harbor beyond? Of course, this is also an area that's projected to be inundated um, by uh, sea level rise and storm surge. So we have to address these larger environmental areas. This too is a social equity issue because we have to protect these neighborhoods uh, from storm inundation. But it's also a park that because it's so low lying, you know, stormwater flooding happens on a regular basis. And this is what people see uh, more, more so than the projections for flooding. Uh, this kind of everyday flooding is what prevents use even of the sports fields um, that are there. And so here you have a little bit of a summary of some of these flooding and infrastructure issues, and you can begin to see that within the larger context. But there's a second layer to this, a second scale, really, that the park operates at. And you can see these tentacles uh, that extend into neighborhoods, extend uh, down to Franklin Park. Um, you can see it, the detail, this goes into Upham's Corner to Jones Hill, um, to a number of inner city neighborhoods through this white swath here uh, of neighborhoods in Roxbury and Dorchester, largely, again, multiracial, multi-ethnic BIPOC communities that don't have direct access to large scale parks. And so because of the size uh, of Moakley, we have an opportunity to make connections directly into those neighborhoods. You know, Karen was talking about um, how a lot of Olmsted's park was born of social reform efforts and trying to clean up the city sewage issues. Uh, the photograph of Jacob Riss in New York, um, this was one of the motivating factors for Olmsted to, and others to create open spaces. Today, we have uh, COVID uh, and other public health issues. And again, it's these neighborhoods of Roxbury, Dorchester, the South End, um, that have some of the high that have had some of the highest rates of COVID, uh, that have some of the highest um, uh, personal and public health issues. And so, how is it that those folks have better access to open space, better access to places like Moakley Park and Boston Harbor, is part of the project. So we're thinking of Moakley not just as a park, but as a park with a series of tethers and connections into these uh, inner city neighborhoods to allow kids safely to get to the park, to the harbor, and really to allow everybody in the city to feel like uh, the harbor is for them. 
you know, the process here, we've done so a lot of engagement even during COVID, and we've really tried hard to talk to the community members that are most affected uh, by the project. Um, we had the opportunity a year and a half ago to really activate the park, um, to have a lot of activities that very deliberately invited kids and families and elders into the park and to use it in different ways as a way to test uh, some ideas about programming and activation. We closed uh, Day Boulevard for the day, allowed kids to, to, to play and really created this very um, strong link uh, between the park uh, and the waterfronts, and, and also programmed it into the night to, to, to help demonstrate how the park could be improved um, and could really be a better place for families uh, and community members uh, around the clock. We've also done a whole lot of extensive um, uh, compiling of the data um, and, and looking at the needs and desires for people to really create a park that has far more activity, very active areas and very quiet, soft, passive landscape areas as well. So that there are a variety of activities and, and that there are things that every kid from across the city uh, wants to do and feels welcome uh, doing it. Uh, in the city. So the, the strategy is, is, is complex. We're trying to stitch things back together to the existing neighborhoods. We're trying to diversify the program, expand the audiences, and at the same time manage some of the um, uh, climate change and water problems uh, that, that, that exist. One of the key features of this is creating direct better access uh, from the adjacent neighborhoods uh, right in and creating the city edge with activities right at the front door of the park. Uh, things like a market space for farmers markets and community events, play areas, basketball courts, places for, for elders to hang out. Uh, the idea that the community across the street feels incredibly welcome and that they don't have to go very far um, to have something to do really, really important for elders, for kids, for, for families. Um, and you can begin to see a little bit of the kinds of activities that might happen there. Within the park, we're improving uh, a number of the sports fields and then creating areas around it uh, with nature play, with quiet groves, with sloped lawns for seating, again, to expand the audiences and, and expand the number of activities that are there. So anything from improving some of the sports fields, allowing them to become performance events, to sledding hills um, and quiet groves uh, with incredible views to the water. And then a coastal park that that reintroduces coastal landscapes, bird watching, uh, those kinds of activities with a number of other activities and a flood control berm that will prevent uh, coastal inundation um, uh, from uh, flooding the nearby park and the nearby uh, neighborhoods uh, as well. And an amphitheater with a water feature um, that, that helps and aids uh, in this flood control. Um, all the time, you know, thinking about how can we create this new waterfront destination, this new waterfront um, experience and knit the park uh, to the waterfront and really invite uh, more people uh, from surrounding neighborhoods and neighborhoods not so far away to a brand new waterfront destination. And so the idea here is to transform this park that, 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 that really needs a little uh, bit of love and attention into something that can address today's most pressing climate changes, but also uh, address some of the most pressing social equity issues uh, that the city and its populations uh, are facing today. After all, we want little girls like this to own this park, to feel like it's for them um, and for them to be able to, um, uh, in a couple decades, tell the kinds of stories that uh, Representative Elugardo was just telling about the connection that she had to nature, to water uh, in the heart of the city. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Reed. That sounds like a fantastic park. I'm going to um, uh, start our conversation by asking uh, a general and historical question. Um, Homestead designed his 
parks to be egalitarian spaces, which people of all social st stations could enjoy. And my question is, is Olmsted's vision of the Emerald Necklace as a democratic space being realized in the way the park is used today? In what ways is it being realized and what ways not yet? Well, I'd love to hear Nika and, and, and Chris's thoughts on this too, but um, I think that that is true. Uh, I, I, I think the Olmsted history though is, is complex. Um, you know, and when you create, when you, when you create some uses for certain um, user groups and, and other areas that are not, then, you know, perhaps you are creating a landscape that is uh, more welcoming to athletes, but not for large families that want to have a picnic or whatever. And uh, I think recreation and recreation and desires are changing. Uh, I think the great news is, is that the Emerald Necklace and the investments that the city of Boston and others are making in new spaces like Moakley Park and uh, or re renovating existing spaces like Moakley Park, I think does allow for, um, for, uh, you know, for a variety of, of uses. Um, but I think that uh, we also do need to recognize that, you know, uh, there are definitely times when people may not feel, um, you know, welcome in, in, a, in a park. And, uh, you know, we, we may send certain signals, you know, do you have a permit? Uh, are you, you know, playing on your skateboard in an appropriate way or not? Um, you know, I don't know if Olmsted uh, envisioned all of the ways that we would need and use open space, uh, and and sometimes the parks allow for that, and sometimes they don't they don't work very well for for everything that people might need them for, um, and I think this is something we need to continue to engage in. We we are working on uh, initiative around the 200th anniversary of Olmsted's birth next year to really uh, reach out and work with neighborhoods in and throughout the city to try and really question that and say, you know, are there ways that we can interpret uh, Olmsted's goal of, of bringing everyone together um, and, and see if there's ways we can do that better? I don't know if anyone else wanted to respond or... Would anyone else like to comment on that question? Chris? Yeah, um, you know, the, the 19th century park movement, Franklin Park, the, the Emerald Necklace, Central Park, were all born of social reform efforts, right? There it was a big social reform effort to give um, everybody from the city a respite from some of the, the tough conditions of the industrial city, the industrial 19th century city. So there was an idea of public health, of social reform, of improving the lives of, of, of people who lived in the cities. Um, but, you know, as, as Karen said, Olmsted was complex. You know, there was also a piece that was very paternalistic. Um, he designed in Central Park carriageways and horse uh, paths and pedestrian ways, which intersect and go off and, and create some beautiful experience. But he was very deliberate. He wrote about this. He said, you know, I'm, I'm interested in bringing different populations in close proximity to one another. And he said this in order so that some could learn from others how to behave, right? I mean, these days, that's just unconscionable to think that way. So his legacy is complex, right? Um, and it's something that we have to think about. Um, you know, it counter to that what what we're what we and many other park designers are trying to do is to do some deep listening with community members, right? Uh, understand what are their perspectives on 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 the park, on open space, on how they want to use these things. What's useful? What's desirable to them? How is it that those sorts of things um, can be built in? And what are the design signals that 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 are um, that w that are given off um, from a park? How can we test um, ideas? How can we better program uh, the park to meet needs? How is it that people can see themselves and their cultures? 
their backgrounds represented in various ways uh, within the park? These are some of the questions that, that take a step toward making a park feel like uh, it's there for everybody or everybody has a place within the park. And I think that's a little bit different, say, um, that, 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 than what Olmsted was doing. I, I love the framing um, that Chris laid out. I think, you know, as both he and Carol were saying, we can and should uh, reflect on the historical inequities, uh, even in mental models that we've inherited. Uh, some that we're still uh, subconsciously carrying and some that we're consciously trying to dismantle. Uh, while we do that at the same time, I think there's also a very uh, inspirational framework that looks at the work of doing things together that accomplish what you want to happen. And I think the world of policy is really excellent for that <laughs> uh, when used appropriately. So, you know, just some things you know, that I've either worked on or uh, had the honor of being around people who are working on looking at even incarcerated populations. How can we engage and reimagine and redesign uh, their living spaces so that even though you have the uh, punishment of losing your freedom, that the experience of being incarcerated is not a further punishment, but actually an, op an opportunity for transformation. And we can think big like that. When we think about youth jobs, I know Karen and I have worked together. I, I slowed it way down by having an accident, but the money's still there and we're still uh, working. Sure, we're going to do it. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. Everybody's still excited. Thank God. <laughs> youth jobs. And when we do youth jobs, not just to throw money at a situation, but to really invest in the types of jobs that are creating career pathways where kids are getting engaged in, in parks and recreation, where they're getting engaged in the Emerald Necklace. And as one of K Karen's colleagues uh, so eloquently laid out for us when we were designing this programming with the Boston Housing Authority for, for their youth up to age 24, is we're not just talking about putting them to work and teaching them about nature, but connecting them to the indigenous heritage, connecting them to the history of the space. And, uh, you know, I don't know if Michael Reiskin is listening right now, but probably 95% of the people on here know who he is. You know, he's a, a constituent of mine who's completely happy to dive in to a public housing setting and talk with kids with BIPOC kids about the history and, and, and learning how to do that in a way they can relate to. But even uh, thinking about, you know, I, I used to do research and, and it was community-based participatory research. And I remember uh, when we did a project teaching some young people how to survey their public housing community about the impacts of climate change on, on, the, on elders they did and they did on, on teenagers. And these were teenagers doing it. The, the young woman who was leading one of our research cohorts, when we started out, she um, had no design on going to college at all. And when we asked her about that, she said, I'm not the kind of person that goes to college. By the time she got finished running this research project and, and producing um, you know, pie charts and, and graphs demonstrating what elders and young people believed about climate change and their policy recommendations for their elected officials, of which I was not yet one. And did it, I don't think know for sure that I was gonna be one. <laughs> um, you know, she actually ended up applying and getting into Bunker Hill and has a plan for her uh, college career path. And so when you're engaging people in the work of learning about this together and in just doing it together, um, you're, you're, shaping the, you're shaping the future so that these panels will look like those kids. They'll look like my nephew, they'll look like us, but then they'll also look like Linnell, you know, and, and, and kids like that. And so I think it's a really exciting opportunity. Um, and while it's so important for us to, to do the critique and to do the historical analysis, uh, of where we've gone wrong and where we are currently uh, continuing to be biased. Just getting to work and investing right now, <laughs> bringing people along uh, in the jobs, in the, in the parks, and elders also need these jobs, by the way. I'm trying to figure out a way <laughs> to, to, to bring that in too. The, the nature is there to be engaged. And so in some ways we don't have to figure it out. Uh, we just have to go outside. <laughs>
Thank you, Representative Elugardo. I love the discussion about the use of design for social issues like better, better prisons, <laughs> better youth jobs. I think it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful factor to, to take into consideration. We're gonna go straight to um, our first audience question. Um, we have quite a few. This first question is from Michael. And he asks, with competing priorities in Boston, namely housing, commercial activity, and green space, how can green space get a foot in the door? Also, is there a dichotomy between active and passive use of open space? What is the way forward? Wow, do we have like a week to answer this question? Uh, I mean, there's are huge questions. Um, I, I, uh, you know, as I as I was thinking about uh, the representative and Chris's answer um, about you know use and uh, I wonder if it's less a question of park design or a question of park management uh, and what we sort of uh, reinforce and support and what we don't. Um, when we don't have restrooms in parks, we don't encourage people to go and spend a long time. When we remove, um, you know, a seating because, uh, you know, powers that be don't think that the people are using the seating correctly and the seating disappears. You know, I don't know if it's so much a question of, um, you know, uh, uh, design or, or, or management. Uh, because we know that these things kind of are moved as acts of erasure over time, uh, to quote uh, another another great architect I'm working with right now on another project. Um, so this, I mean, the, the question about passive and active space, I think is very complex. I think that there are, um, there are, uh, uh, there are issues around historic preservation and the preservation of spaces. And sometimes those are those discussions about preservation are about preservation, and sometimes they're about keeping a status quo and sort of not, um, you know, making a space or or flexible spaces for for different populations. I've definitely seen that. Um, and the, I mean, the question of how how do you uh, prioritize park space in an incredibly uh, challenging financial uh, real estate market? Uh, I think a lot of that really comes from the tops in, in terms of leadership and sort of zoning requirements and sort of, uh, you know, tenant and other kinds of uh, protections that a lot of cities have rolled back, um, you know, and, and uh, you know, it is a sad day when, you know, when you want to renovate a park or you want to, you know, even just make a small improvement to a park. And, and people are concerned that that will change the economics of their neighborhood and they will no longer be able to live there. So I don't have an answer for you, except, um, you know, it really does require, uh, you know, real political, I think, leadership. Okay, uh, unless someone else wants to take that, I was going to move on to the next question. There's someone dying to answer this question. Okay. Um, the next question is, uh, basically says that Mayor Walsh was attentive to some of these issues we're talking about, but it's not clear there will be continuity in the evolution of Boston's climate planning. For example, Moakley Park is already threatened by recent severe weather events, and these are likely to be more frequent and more severe in the coming decades. So the question is, are we climate ready? Maybe Chris, you would like to take that one. Sure. Um, uh, we are getting climate ready. Um, uh, and um, I think uh, we've seen some continuity um, from uh, uh, Mayor Walsh to Mayor Janey's administration uh, in continuing to move this forward. Um, uh, I think everybody realizes this is a critical project. Um, it's not just a climate project, uh, but it what is one where climate issues and impacts will directly impact um, uh, BIPOC multiracial uh, communities, uh, given the proximity of the park uh, to these public housing um, uh, developments. The, the, the advantage here 
is that those are communities that will not be displaced. Oftentimes when you talk about park improvements, um, investing in open space, people worry about gentrification and displacement. Um, in this case, because the city of Boston owns that property, they have the ability to keep the current residents in place so that those that are there now can both be the folks who are protected in the future and also um, directly benefit from the improvements that are being made uh, in, the open, in, in the open space. I mean, it's a complex environment that we're in. There are competing needs, um, uh, putting food on the table, getting good education and good school, uh, the need for affordable housing and the need for um, a great new open space. I don't think any one of these um, can, you know, separate itself from the others. It needs to be part of a, a comp set of comprehensive uh, solutions. Um, uh, but, but from a public health standpoint, from a getting outside and just enjoying nature, from having that ability to just, you know, sit and look at the sky with your back on a sloped uh, lawn, right? that moment to be able to make a connection that you can't make um, on the street in front of your house is so critically important um, uh, that 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 op I, my feeling is that open space planning and upgrade will continue to be uh, a major agenda uh, you know not only across the city but 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 across the u.s thank you um, we have time for one last audience question this comes from daniel and it's a question for Representative El Ugardo. Um, Daniel says, I was intrigued that you told of a transformative experience at Blue Hills. How do you think about the relationship between neighborhood parks like Moakley and regional parks like Blue Hills in supporting people's diverse needs for green space? What a great question. Uh, you know, I lived in the Netherlands while I was in law school for a bit with my daughter uh, and my husband and uh, sort of dreamed a dream there for Massachusetts. <laughs> we would have uh, something like Olmsted's vision, but across the entire Commonwealth, where you could uh, take a very long time and walk or take a, 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 le a less long time and bike from one end to, of, of Massachusetts to the other. And then that many of the urban, suburban and rural uh, wonders that we have to offer would be interconnected by bike paths and uh, pedestrian friendly access points. And so I think bringing that vision on both the micro level so that some of the issues that Chris was raising, you can, you, you can theoretically walk across the street to the ocean, but you can't walk across the street. I used to live in Harbor Point uh, my husband and I and my daughter, who's now grown and married, we still go over to Castle Island. We hardly ever see any Black people there, more now than uh, 10 years ago. But it is a matter of access. You kind of have to drive over there to get over there. <laughs> you know, and uh, I've ridden bikes over there. It doesn't feel safe. And so making it safe for um, all modes of transit, uh, not only to access the place next door, but to connect that place to these bigger experiences physically, physically, civil engineering wise is really, really critical. But then as has been raised by, uh, you know, all the panelists, um, there's also a psychological, a psychological planting that needs to happen. And that needs to happen in schools. It needs to happen again through jobs programs. It needs to happen by integrating the concepts of, of green access and green space access in all of our different pieces of policy and all of our different uh, work that we do in education too. Thank you. I think um, Gavin is going to take it away at this point. Well, uh, Catherine can also say, but I just wanted to thank all of you uh, for a wonderful conversation. Um, and I don't know if Catherine, if you'd like to say something. Oh my gosh, no, that was really an amazing program. And I think I'm, I'm gonna speak for the entire audience. You have inspired us. It just needs to get a little warmer. And this weekend I am going out into nature. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thanks everybody, goodbye. 
Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.